welcome. Um, we're just going to get started, and I'm sure other people will be walking in, and we'll, the, the conversation will continue because the topic of today's, of today's uh, discussion and lecture is something about which it's really, there's, there's a lot to say and a lot to ask and a lot to cover, and I'm sure we will, we will hear a really interesting uh, argument and presentation, and then people will raise all sorts of things that are tangentially related to it. <laughs> um, it is my uh, great pleasure to welcome back to campus Jeffrey Cohen, who is a graduate of Cleveland, Case Western Reserve University, at Delbert and Western Reserve College as of 1973, and has went off from there to the University of Michigan to study political science and earn his PhD, and has had a long and distinguished career, um, and is now professor of political science at Fordham University after appointments actually sort of around the country, but, uh, and, but is in the past um, decade especially been writing a series of really interesting books about the presidency. And um, yes, he told me the other day, um, it's book publishers want to publish books, <laughs> journal <laughs> editors want to eject articles, <laughs> and you can sort of say what you want to say at book length. So, so he's discovered uh, that, that books are the way to go. Um, but uh, Jeff is uh, one of the country's leading in, uh, experts on particularly with the presidency and the media. Um, and he's been doing work recently on essentially the, pres the, the presidency in this new political system we have here, which is uh, really appears to be quite different from the political system we learned about when some of us old folk were going to graduate school. Where we kept learning about how uh, weak American political parties were. And uh, that doesn't, and the political scientists used to talk about how we needed responsible party government and strong parties. And well, now we've got strong parties, but maybe not responsible party government. The two may not be associated quite so well. Uh, and this changes substantially the sort of strategic positions of presidents, or at least I think it might, which is why I asked him to give this talk. I would like to suggest to you that if you're interested in this broad theme of how the American political system is changing, and in particular, how the new party structure is affecting it. On October 26th uh, at uh, noon uh, in the Wallstein Memorial, I mean, in the Wallstein Medical uh, Audit, uh, Building Auditorium, we're going to have uh, a talk about Congress and the new party system by Francis Lee of, uh, of the University of Maryland, and, and that's also in memory of our late colleague, Alec Lamas. And all the information is on the Center for Policy Studies website. So, as I said, to my mind, this is the most important set of questions one can ask about American politics these days. And I'm really happy that uh, Professor Cohen has agreed to join us and talk about one part of how the political system is changing within, that our governance is changing within the new party system. Uh, thank you, Joe, and um, thank everybody for inviting me back uh, to Western Reserve. I'm old enough not to consider this to be one school but two. Uh, in fact, I'm a little schizophrenic because I got accepted back in 1969 into a Delbert College. They changed everything on me and made me graduate Western Reserve College. I, I understand that neither one of those exist anymore, um, but they do in my heart. And um, it's, it's wonderful to see all the changes here around campus, um, but also so much that looks the same so that at least I didn't get lost wandering around. Uh, today, what, what I'd like to do is uh, talk about the Obama presidency, and I'm going to deviate a little bit from the title because I can never come up with titles that have anything to do with what I'm doing. And what I really would like to do is to talk about how to assess Obama's first term as president, some people's hope only term as president. Um, and. Uh, I want to start this out by talking about what standards should we use for trying to evaluate. Is this on okay? Yeah, for trying to evaluate a president. Um, there are lots of different standards uh, that we can apply. Uh, we can compare Obama to other presidents, you know, make that more detailed. We can talk about his reaction to events in the world, such you know, political events, economic and social conditions. 
But um, I want to take a different tack. And what I want to do is use Obama's 2008 presidential election campaign and what he promised in that campaign as a standard to evaluate his presidency, in part because we have a very, very mixed picture of Obama as president. A lot of the reason that we have a mixed picture of the president, I think, is because he had uh, a campaign that set up contradictory expectations, or these expectations, uh, several different expectations that could not be fulfilled at the same time simultaneously. And that's caused a lot of people to be confused by what he does and a lot of people to be disappointed in him as president because he, he hasn't done uh, exactly everything he said he would like to do because you can't. Uh, so what was Obama's basic campaign? Uh, there are two important slogans here which really summarize what he was offering to, to the public. Uh, one of the things about the very modern presidency, maybe it's just true of democracies in general, is that everything becomes slogans. So, uh, but what we need to do is peer a little bit more deeply into the slogans and what they really mean. And he had two phrases uh, that he repeated in the 2008 campaign, change you can count on. I'll spend a few minutes talking about what I think he means by that, or at least what people thought he meant by that. And then the second slogan is the post-partisan presidency. And again, we need to talk about what exactly that means. And a lot of the talk is going to be asking, um, is Obama an agent of change? And what does that entail? Is Obama a post-partisan president? And the answer to both of those questions is yes and no. A little bit of, of both, but uh, not necessarily a whole lot. And along the way, I want to talk also a little bit about um, the particular campaign promises that he's made. Um, and I, it was actually rather surprising that there's been about 500 of them in the 2008 campaign. Um, so uh, let's start by trying to understand what these two slogans of um, mean, change you can believe in in a post-partisan presidency. My take when I was listening to Obama's campaign and trying to understand what he's offering up in 2008, was to try to understand what this change you can believe in. To me, it's a code phrase for getting rid of George W. Bush, getting rid of conservative policies, um, basically replacing a conservative administration with a more liberal administration. And it's going to be an action-oriented administration, Obama's. You know, it's going to be an administration that is going to be marked on accomplishments, concrete accomplishments in public policies, and the public policies are going to look liberal. Um, th this dovetails in with um, my poor attempt at a title, which we'll come back to with um, uh, polarization and partisanship, uh, with the two different parties dividing uh, along those lines very much. Uh, but the more curious Part of the slogan is a post-partisan presidency. The first thing I started thinking about was um, post-modernism and all kinds of things going on in the humanities that I just have the foggiest idea what they're doing. Um, but I think what Obama was talking about is that as president, he's going to behave differently in office. Um, he's going to try to unite the nation as opposed to divide it with the idea that partisanship and polarization divide the nation. Uh, there's going to be less heated political rhetoric. It's going to be a more inclusive style of political leadership. Um, he's going to try towards bipartisanship, which means compromising with Republicans. <coughs> And the end result of that, though he's not really very explicit about it, is that this process change in the way you do politics is going to lead to moderate policies. 
you basically can't be a compromiser with the opposition party and produce liberal policies. The, um, if you're going to compromise with the opposition party, at most you're going to have moderate public policies. That means that the change you can believe in and the post-partisan presidency idea are in tension. You can't really be doing the same thing. You can't be an action president who's going to produce a liberal political agenda and get it through Congress and at the same time be a post-partisan president who's going to be inclusive and listen to everybody, including the Republicans, which is going to produce a different style of public policy. It's, like I always do with my notes in class, I go faster than my slides. Um, now, why does Obama adopt these two contradictory impulses in his campaign, these two contradictory slogans. Um, I, I think it's um, a strategic reason that grows out of campaigning. A and election campaigning often requires politicians to take contradictory positions in order to gain voters. On the one hand, the change you can believe in is a way of mobilizing Democratic support. Remember, he had a very, very difficult campaign against oh, kind of the stalwart of the Democratic Party, Hillary Clinton. You know, he had to generate some uh, support from the Democratic base, you know, rebuild a base after a very divisive uh, primary season. Uh, you can't win an election if you're not carrying your own party. But in today's politics, neither the Democrats nor the Republicans are large enough as a political party to win elections without the middle, um, without independents or moderates. Um, independents and moderates, almost by definition, do not have very strong policy preferences, but they seem to have fairly strong emotional reactions to the way we carry out politics in this partisan environment. They don't like it. They're alienated by it. They shut down. Uh, but Obama needs their votes. So by saying that he's going to be a post-partisan, that, that he's going to be inclusive, um, a compromiser, that he's going to listen to everybody, that middle segment of the population um, is going to be attracted to him. And as an electoral strategy, this really did work. He won, um, if not a landslide election, really a pretty clear election. Um, the clearest Democratic victory since the Kennedy-Johnson era, which, which says something about the Democratic Party. So um, he pulled together a winning strategy um, for modern times that Democrats haven't seen in a very, very very long time, um, two political generations. OK, um, with, with that in mind, with the idea that you can't be a postpartisan and an agent of change in this current environment, uh, let's look at the Obama record and try to figure out uh, which way did he tend towards. Uh, was it being more of a postpartisan? Was it being uh, more of a change agent. And basically, I'm going to say this, there's a little bit of both and that there's a lot of contradictory evidence going on, um, in part because by trying to play to two different audiences, two different groups of voters um, who want very, very different things out of him, he's just tacking in very, very different directions and, and responding um, in a short-term fashion um, and has not produced a very consistent-looking presidency because of that. Um, so uh, let's start with this change you can believe in. Uh, there's a couple of things that we can look at. We can ask, how much has he accomplished? The idea of being a change agent is to produce public policies. And then we also want to ask, what is the nature of those public policies? Did they actually change anything, or did they just uh, reproduce the status quo? Um, they did a little bit of both. So uh, uh, on a rather crude level, uh, let's go back to the many, many campaign promises that he made in 2008. And here's a presidential scorecard that a group called PolitiFact.com collected. Um, rather amazing job of reading through everything they did and then trying to track down um, everything that happened during the administration. Now, there's a mythology in American public opinion that, that goes back a very, very long time that campaign promises are cheap talk. Um, by cheap talk, it means that politicians are never 
are not really serious about trying to fulfill their promises. Most of the empirical evidence by political scientists who have been studying presidential campaigns all the way back to the early 1950s suggests that presidents are really pretty serious about this. Um, administrations really do try to work at what they do. Um, and they vary in success. They often vary in success because of the political conditions that confront them, um, whether their party controls the Congress or not, what the public mood is likely to be at that time, and what kind of um, political or other kind of events just occur that can knock an agenda off course. Um, but if we look here, uh, Obama doesn't do a very good job of promise fulfillment. You know, it's, um, they have here about 37%, which is um, not really very high in historical comparison. And, and, and in a lot of these promises, there's lots of easy promises going on. Um, what's rather striking is that there is some compromising, but not as much compromising as you would expect of a postpartisan president. And what's even more surprising to me is that there's a lot of broken promises. Um, he breaks as many promises as he compromises on. Um, and I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail in a minute or so, but not all the broken promises are because he gave up on something that Congress will not enact. Uh, some of the broken promises, some very important broken promises, were done within the administration. Um, but here we have you know, 500 campaign promises that vary in importance. So there's a whole lot of trivia in here. There's a whole lot of pandering to interest groups and the like. Um, when we talk about presidents and presidential leadership, we really want to talk about the core of what they uh, wanted to try to do. So again, these um, PolitiFact people, uh, by looking at the campaign and the priorities that Obama set for himself and the amount of time he worked on things, the amount of news coverage, that certain issues got. They spliced out what they thought were the 25 really important items for his administration. And even here, the numbers look almost identical to what I just showed in the earlier chart. You know, um, 40% uh, of promises were fulfilled you know, for the important things compared to 37% for everything. Um, again, th there's a fairly large number of broken promises here. There's a bit of compromising, and there's a whole lot that uh, we're still working on. Um, the clock is ticking really very, very fast, so this still working on is going to wind up being unfulfillments, um, you know, which chalk up to negatives for him in this. Um, in terms of basic policy accomplishment, when we just tally up things without looking at their substance, he really looks quite mediocre in terms of American presidents. Um, uh, but let's talk a little bit more about the broken promises. Um, you know, and here, you know, different people have you know, different takes on what counts as in a, bro a broken promise or not. There's a variety of different ways that a president can break a promise. Um, sometimes congressional resistance is so severe that he just gives up. Um, sometimes congressional resistance is so severe that he sells the House. Um, sometimes he just finds that what he promised isn't going to work and he has to backtrack. So um, here's just uh, some examples of some very important policy issues that were talked about in the 2008 presidential election that Obama, Obama broke his promises on. And when we look at the broken promises, you begin to get a sense of what a politician is willing to give up, at what they're not willing to fight for. Uh, and you begin to see a better sense of um, what their true nature is. Um, one thing um, that he gave up on was creating a foreclosure prevention fund for homeowners. Uh, again, there was congressional resistance to this. More important, there was Wall Street resistance to this. Um, and there may have just been bigger things going on. And most economists talked about that it, it wasn't such a great idea. Um, he talked about repealing the Bush tax cuts. Last night he talked about repealing the Bush, I mean, yeah, the Bush tax cuts on high income earners. We'll come back to this. He signed a bill in 2010 extending 
the Bush tax cuts for high income earners. Um, again, maybe not his fault uh, that he had to do that, uh, but that happened to him. Um, very early decision uh, in his own administration, which is just purely an administrative decision, he said he was going to close down the detention center in Guantanamo Bay. He never thought what he was going to do with the prisoners and where he was going to send them. So they backtracked on that. And I gather that they're still there and it's still open. Um, another thing in the administration, he wanted to create revolving door rules for administration employees. This meant that people that get hired into his administration were going to have to sign something to say that if they left the administration, they couldn't go and work for the private sector for a certain period of time. He couldn't get anybody to sign into his administration with that kind of a rule, so he dropped it. Um, and then cap and trade. You know, another Republican policy that the Democrats have adopted, that as soon as the Democrats adopt it, the baby no longer looks any good to the Republicans, and he can't get that through, and he just gives up on it. And so there's a mixture here of political realities are stopping him, administrative implementations are stopping him, and, um, and maybe uh, what leads to broken promises is stupid policy promises to begin with in campaigns. Um, if either of these two, well, one of these two are going to get elected in November. Last night, they both made a lot of things that are going to haunt them um, as president because there's a lot of simple-mindedness in what, what they offer. But um, that's par for the course in politics. Uh, some other broken promises, to, but to try not to belabor the point, but it goes on and on, and you kind of get a picture here. Um, he wanted to, he supported the release of photos showing American soldiers abusing prisoners in Iraq and Afghanistan. The military said no. He caved in on that. So it never signed an administrative order to allow that. Um, he said that he wanted to uh, disallow the exceptions to PAYGO. PAYGO was a way of funding the government, that means that if you're going to adopt a new program that's going to cost money, you have to find some other way. You either have to find the money for it or you have to get rid of something else. And very early in the administration, he decides, oh, that's just not a very good idea either. Um, oh, and then this should be non-controversial. Um, the Armenians for almost a century now have been claiming that there was a Turkish genocide committed after the First World War. And they've been uh, pursuing the United Nations and the United States and other places to call that a genocide. Obama goes, fine, I agree with that. We should just call that a genocide. He becomes president. The Turks say no. Turkey's very, very important strategically. So he caves in on that. Um, he promised to reduce earmarks. You know, these special provisions in budget bills that go to particular congressional districts. And in the 2009 budget round, he decides, well, we're not going to worry about this this year. Um, I think it's been forgotten since. Um, he wanted to create jobs programs, and he would pay for the jobs programs by finding cuts somewhere else. Well, he decided, no, I'm not going to find any programs to cut in order to create jobs programs, so I'm just not going to ask for any jobs programs. Um, and then uh, in um, 2008 and 2009, when oil prices are going up, a lot of people were claiming that the oil companies were getting windfall profits, which usually is what happens when oil prices go up. So Obama, the candidate, says, we should tax those windfall profits until he becomes president and goes, no, we shouldn't. We're not going to tax. Actually, he just drops it, doesn't talk about it whatsoever. There's a whole slew of very, very important policies. Um, some of them we can understand why he breaks the promise because he can't get cooperation. 
Um, other times, he's getting resistance from sectors of the economy, from interest groups, from industries, from select groups of voters, or else a lot of these are just not well thought out policy positions to begin with. Um, but that doesn't make him particularly special. It just makes him another politician, okay? So um, I, I don't want to get on his case so much, but the broken promises tell us something about where the heart and soul of the administration lies, and, and it's not in these kind of policies. Uh, so when we look at all of this, why so little policy progress? And some of you are thinking, well, there's been some policy progress. Yes, there's been some policy progress, but if you just tally up the numbers, and, and being um, a product of the Michigan graduate program many years ago, all we do is count things up um, and don't assess whether they're important or not. Um, he's not really um, the most impactful of presidents. Um, part of it has to do with the political realities of the world that presidents live in. Presidents have two different ways of making public policies. They can make them through executive orders, um, and they can make them through legislation. Uh, presidents prefer to make policy through legislation because once a policy has been implemented that way, it's very hard to change, in part because it's so hard to make legislation to begin with. Um, they may fall back on executive orders if they have either the constitutional or the legislative authority to do so. Uh, you cannot implement, you cannot make public policy with an executive order if there's not an already um, legal or constitutional rationale for doing it. Um, Obama probably would have loved to have gone around Congress and implemented health care through executive orders, but there was no implementing authority. He couldn't do it, um, has to go through legislation. Okay, so um, what, what I want to do is um, look a little bit at Obama's use of executive orders, a little bit of Obama's record of legislative accomplishment, because this actually turned out to be rather weird to me. Um, we've all known that he's had really difficult times with Congress in getting legislation passed. So you would think, well, when he can use executive orders, well, let's look at executive orders. This is um, a comparison of the number of executive orders that presidents from Truman through Obama issued their first year, their first term in office. It's not to the complete end of the Obama administration, but um, it gets pretty close to the end here, I mean, until the end of last summer. Uh, just you know, a couple months ago. Obama is the lightest issuer of executive orders of any of the modern presidents, uh, by a fairly wide margin. Um, that's really kind of odd because of the difficulties he has with Congress. He's not using the executive order route at all. Um, he's not even using it as much as he could to reverse prior Bush policies. Uh, which you can do. You know, if Bush issued things through an executive order, you just issue a new executive order and rescind it. He doesn't even do that very much. Now, that would be fine and dandy if he's getting a lot of legislation passed. Well, this is what the legislation record looks like for major legislation. Not just major legislation that comes out of his administration, but major legislation that comes out of other places that he adopts as his own like Dodd-Frank and other things. The first two years in office when he has a Democratic majority, he's doing okay, but this 17 for 2010, a good handful of these come after the midterm elections that he got trounced on and basically he caves into Republican policies. So that's an inflated number. What's maybe more important is to look at the record at 211 and 212. His legislative presidency basically stops. Okay, he's given up on trying to pass things through legislation, and he's given up on trying to implement public policies for the most part through executive orders. So um, uh, there's really not, by this count, necessarily much in the way of a change agent as president. Um, I'll come back to that because um, you know, we can always pick and choose our facts in the way we're looking at things. 
Um, and yeah, there's been some really big things that have gone on um, in his administration, but um, so, so we'll come back. Another way of looking at whether Obama is a change agent is to ask, what are public perceptions of Obama? Do they think that he's a change agent or not? Um, again, as somebody who went to Michigan, I've learned to love public opinion polls. Um, they, they often tell us a whole lot about the political world that I didn't really think they could tell us. But um, um, the public may be stupid, but it's not necessarily foolish. <laughs> so um, January 2011, Associated Press ran a poll. This is, you know, this is the beginning of the third year of the Obama presidency. So we have the first two years. Um, the years of the major accomplishments, you know, if there are any major accomplishments for the Obama presidency. And they ask, uh, th this is the way the question reads to respondents in the survey. Barack Obama campaigned in the 2008 presidential election on a platform of change. Do you think Barack Obama so far is living up to his promises to change the way things work in Washington? Do you think he is breaking those promises or is it too soon to tell? Well, about a quarter of the people say that, yeah, he's living up to being a change agent, but a larger percentage of people say that he's breaking those promises. Um, but what's really very striking, and Obama is on some levels the luckiest man in the world. He's been president for two solid years, and 40% of the people say it's still too early to tell. Um, these may be the people of extremely low expectations. Um, I think I'd like to sell them the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, because it actually is fairly far into a presidential administration. But um, the most important part coming out of this is that um, as of the beginning of the third year in office, not a lot of people are viewing Barack Obama as a change agent, okay? You know, so these public impressions are kind of being consistent with the stuff that I've just gone through. Uh, I've been trying to look for other kinds of uh, information about public opinion. One of the classic questions that, that we like to sort of track public reactions to what's going on, especially with the administration, is this question about whether you think the country is headed in the right direction or the wrong direction. And what, all I've done here, um, these I think were from Pew polls, is taken the percentage of people who said that he's in uh, that the country's going in the wrong direction and subtracted that from the percentage of people who said that the country's going in the right direction. And notice here, you, know, you have to look at uh, the y-axis over there. It never tops zero. Always more people think the country's going in the wrong direction than the right direction. Now, early on in the administration, you do see a moving towards the right direction, it goes on for three or four months, and then it plummets, and there, then there's just been a serious deterioration in this. Um, you get this massive meltdown uh, last summer, actually the summer ago, 2011, with the debt ceiling issue. Um, and even though we can say that you know Congress is partially culpable in what's going on here, the president is primarily the one who the public is thinking about in a lot of this. Um, Obama took a lot of blame for what happened in the debt ceiling crisis. It really tarnished him on, on many, many poll results. As soon as that was over, um, after a couple of months of people kind of forgetting a little bit, you know, it comes back up. Um, the economy actually starts chugging along pretty well. Europe begins to look like they're going to solve the Greece problem. Um, the United States economy didn't collapse because of the debt ceiling crisis, but then when you start getting into 2012, um, everything starts falling apart again. I haven't tr traced this out for the last six months of the year because then you get into the campaign season and this number doesn't really make much sense to look at. Um, as an indicator of what's going on for the president so much as what's likely to happen with um, the campaign. But it's still hovering in this 40% um, to the negative side, which is not very good. Uh, so um, even if he's a change agent, he's changing us the wrong way. 
Okay, not really very good for a president. Uh, so let recap this a little bit of the president as a change agent. It looks really very mixed. Um, he has, um, in just quantitative terms, he hasn't accomplished as much as he promised. Um, and the public that was initially rather optimistic about him as you know, the, the um, knight in shining armor who's going to save everybody, kind of, that's dissipated. Um, now, if you don't like thinking about things just in terms of numbers, like I show, um, think about these three big policies. Okay, so um, let's take um, his big accomplishment, health care. This is a fundamental change. It's the largest social policy program since Lyndon Johnson's Great Society. It's a big deal. It's going to realter, I mean, you can't realter, it's going to alter the political economy of the United States. Um, some people say for good, some people say for bad, but it's going to have a massive change on US society, okay? That's change. But um, now let's go to his economic policies, his macroeconomic policies. It's kind of ambiguous that things have really worked. Stimulus package, yeah, a little bit, but not all that much. Um, we're still talking about the Great Recession. We still have very, very high unemployment rates, you know, um, this far into a recovery, you know, if there really is a recovery. Um, maybe we want to, maybe we don't want to blame him for everything going on, but um, it's not clear that, um, He's stewarded the economy particularly well. Now let's go to a third policy area. Wall Street, especially the banks. Um, I like to call this business as usual. What did he do? He signed on to the Republican program to make sure that the big banks continue to run the economy, the financial system. Um, not much change there. If so, if you just take three of the biggest domestic policies on his watch as president, it's ambiguous as to whether he's really a change agent or not. Okay? So um, if it's ambiguous whether he's a change agent, maybe he's a postpartisan. Okay? Um, how will we know if he's a postpartisan? Well, we should be seeing in the best of all worlds higher levels of bipartisan support in Congress. He should be getting Republican support for some things that he wants. Um, he should be um, also getting bipartisan support from the public. And when we look at his policy positions, he should basically be taking moderate stances as opposed to liberal stances. We can also be looking at, and this is the really important thing that's the hardest to track, what is his public rhetoric right, like? What's he talking about? What kind of you know, words and symbols is he using? Is he increasing partisan rancor or not? I can't deal with that third one, which is maybe the most interesting of these because it's, um, it's just too big to do in such a short period of time with the amount of political rhetoric and trying to make sense of everything. But I can begin to address the other two uh, a little bit. And um, so let's go to whether he's getting support from the opposition. Um, and first, let's look at public opinion. And what, what this is are um, weekly Gallup polls of presidential approval. And they're just broken down by um, the Democrats, independents, and Republicans. And you can see here that Democratic approval varies uh, across the first 180 or so weeks of his administration in the 80 to 90 percent. That's pretty nice. Um, after a little bit of the afterglow of his inaugural, Republicans are giving him on average about a 15 percent approval rating. Um, now, we shouldn't expect a Democratic president to be really popular among Republicans. But if he's truly a post-partisan president, what we should have been seeing is that over time, Republicans learn that he's not a beast, 
that you can live with him, that he's a president, and maybe this gap between the partisan perspectives on the president should be narrowing, and maybe they should be smaller than they were during George W. Bush's time, or Bill Clinton's time, or George W. George H. W. Bush. They're bigger. They're the it's, this is the widest gap we've ever seen. You, you basically can't get it any wider than it is. And it's wider in a steady state period. Nothing he does resonates among Republicans. And Democrats are a little bit more volatile, but they'll hold their nose at almost anything he does. I mean, that's almost the definition of polarization. OK, well. You can't always trust the public. Um, so let's look at Congress. Um, and here what I have for um, the first three years, the 2012 figures aren't available yet, is um, voting support by different members of Congress. So we have Senate Democrats, House Democrats, Senate Republicans, and House Republicans. Republicans, and this is the average percentage of support by members of those four groupings. The Senate just loves Obama. Over 90% of the time, or the way of thinking about this is that on any roll call, 90% of the Democrats in the Senate are going to support Obama's position. The House is a little bit less inclined to support him. I'm less inclined for two reasons. Some members of the House are representing districts that have got a lot of Republicans, so they're worried about their flank. The more important reason is that there are some, let's call them phony votes that happen in the Senate, things where everybody in the Senate votes for the president no matter what, minor treaties and lots of appointments to the administration. You've got to cut all those things out. And the Senate numbers would fall down to about where the House is. Um, when you look at the Republicans, you know, the, the Senate doesn't look like it's so antagonistic, but again, those numbers are inflated because of all of these hurrah type of votes. So you really want to look at the House of Representatives, you know, and he's getting very, very low support levels from the House. Um, when the House Republicans vote the same side as Obama, are on votes when everybody is on the same side. But as soon as there's a partisan controversy, Obama's vote support among Republicans goes as close to zero as you could possibly go. Uh, and it, it's often at zero. So um, there's a lot of polarization in Congress. Um, there's a lot of polarization in the public. If he was a truly effective postpartisan president, we shouldn't see this much polarization. Um, another way of looking at whether Obama is a postpartisan is to look at some of the substance of the policies. So I want to go through some policies, and then I want to go through some other kind of more systematic evidence, and you get a very foggy picture. Um, in fact, if we look at the early Obama administration, I wonder if it was not the third term of George W. Bush. Let me make the case. Um, look at some important foreign policy decisions that Obama made taking office. Bill Gates becomes his defense secretary, a holdover from the Bush administration. OK, Bill Gates is a really well-respected man, but he's a Republican. You're going to tell me that there's no Democrat who could have done this. I mean, there's got to be some right-wing Democrat who you can put in the Defense Department, like Joe Lieberman. But no, he wants a Republican. Hillary Clinton, he puts in the cabinet. A lot of positive things that you can say about Hillary Clinton, but she was one of the most vocal advocates on the war in Iraq in the beginning. She's another hawk on that issue. Um, and then the war in Afghanistan, John McCain light, the surge light that McCain pushed through on Iraq is what Obama decided to follow in Afghanistan. 
Would they send another 25 or 30,000 troops there? George Bush's policies. If, you, if you're not winning, send more troops, okay? No, and we're still there. Um, and then what I really like, of a little known thing, um, he went to France. Everybody's got to go to France. Um, he holds a town hall in France. American presidents love to hold town halls. He admonishes the French for not being more militaristic on the war on terror. Right out of the George W. Bush playbook. Okay? Um, now, he may be right about all these things, but in terms of public policies, who do you have? The guy from Texas, the guy from Illinois, or Siamese twins? Okay? Um, what about economic policy? I mean, economic policy is the great divider between the parties in American history. He appoints Tim Geithner Secretary of the Treasury. Tim Geithner, though he's a Democrat, was a Bush appointee serving at the Federal Reserve who basically authored the TARP program to save the banks. Then, when the chairman of the Federal Reserve's position comes due for reappointment, he decides to reappoint Bernanke, a Republican. You're telling me he couldn't find a bald-bearded Jewish liberal economist? Yeah, he could have. So no, he needs a bald-bearded Jewish moderate Republican, OK? Um, then he supports the TARP program, which is basically a bailout to the banks. They could have followed the prescription of other economists, which was to take the banks that were too big to fail and break them up, or let one of the big banks fail. No, he's not going to do that. Okay? Um, the stimulus package, the primary means of trying to jumpstart an economy in a recession, and despite what the Tea Party may say because they don't believe in counter cyclical policy making, he basically asked for about one half of what the liberal economists argue is necessary to do the job, and that it wasn't a program that was long enough. Two years of money you know, instead of four or five years worth of money. Um, and then, which I mentioned before, um, he supported the extension of the Bush tax cuts in the tax bill in 2010, partially because he lost the midterm elections, couldn't do any better. And, um, but he, um, he basically reincorporated the Bush economic team into his administration, did not listen to the left wing in the Democratic Party on economic policy, and followed mostly Bush economic policies um, when it comes to macroeconomic policy. Um, and you can argue with me a little bit. Yeah, Bush would have had a smaller stimulus package than Obama, but still they both would have been of this medium to small size, according to the left. Um, healthcare policy, most important piece of liberal legislation, he sells out the liberal provision, the public option. He jettisons it as soon as there's any resistance in Congress. In fact, when the Senate comes up with a version of the bill that doesn't have it, and the House does have it, he tells Nancy Pelosi, go cash in your jewelry. We're not going that way. Maybe for good practical political reasons, because he didn't think he could get it through. He never did get a Republican vote for this. So why did he have to give it up? OK, but still he gave it up. Um, and after all of this, especially on the health care issue, Howard Dean has another hissy fit in public. Um, 
This time, not in the New Hampshire primary, it's on MSNBC. <laughs> and he starts com criticizing Obama as not being a liberal. Um, doesn't go so far as to call him a Republican. Um, but there's a bit of liberal disenchantment. OK. Um, another way of looking at whether Obama is liberal or moderate is to go to more systematic evidence, which is kind of the totality of the record, the way the quantifiers like to do this. Again, it's not necessarily a better way of doing it. Um, it's just that you don't get a choice of being able to pick and choose what you include. You include everything that's available. And the uh, Americans for Democratic Action, for a very, very long period of time, going back to the end of the Second World War, have been cataloging votes in Congress and identifying them as tests of supporting liberalism versus not supporting liberalism. And there are issues in this, but um, you know, one of the issues is making the votes comparable from year to year. So political scientists who are a little bit smarter than me have figured out a way of making these numbers comparable. And you can just um, look here is, um, again, on, on the other axis, is the percentage of voting support by the president for the liberal position. And Obama does not look out of phase with every other Democratic president since Harry Truman. They all hover in this 75 or 80% liberal position with these corrected scores that make everything comparable. Um, but by this measure, he looks pretty liberal. The Republicans, on the other hand, just look like they're getting increasingly more conservative. Uh, now, I have friends who complain when I show them this because they say, you're picking on the Republicans. You're saying that they're just getting more conservative. And I go, that's not the point. The party has changed. We know it's changed. Um, and the parties have been dividing. Basically, the Democrats can't get any more liberal. But the Republicans in this can get more conservative because the Republicans started out being a fairly moderate party. And so on. But now what we have is a Republican Party that um, at the presidential level that hardly ever takes a liberal position, and a Democratic presidency that takes a liberal position um, on um, approximately four out of every five votes that comes up. So um, by this measure, Obama does it. He looks like a liberal. When earlier I was going through some big issues he looks more like a waffler. We can't really decide where he is. Um, let's go to public opinion a little bit, again, like I did before. What does the public view Obama as? Um, I actually like public perceptions of presidential positions this way because um, they tend to be fairly accurate and make a lot of sense. Um, and uh, here is a set of surveys that ask voters, would you characterize Obama as liberal, moderate, or conservative? Um, generally, around 60% of voters call him a liberal. Um, you know, a small, you know, about 20% or so would call him a moderate. Very few people call him a conservative, you know, about 10%. Um, that's kind of reasonable. I have a little bit of issue with the polling organization that does this. Uh, we, they tend to have a bit of a Republican bias in this, and maybe it's a little bit of an overstatement, but it winds up not really being much of one. Um, but there's another question that Pew has asked, which is um, they ask voters, does Obama listen more to the moderates in the Democratic Party or to the liberals in the Democratic Party? Um, now, if you're a Republican, you may say that there's no such thing as a moderate in a Democratic Party, but a Democrat would say the same thing about the Republicans. Now, there are a couple of polls that uh, I don't know what to make sense of um, that, that just have these valleys here. But um, for the most part, for the first two years of the Obama administration, um, Fairly sizable pluralities of voters says that Obama listens more to the liberals than the moderates within his own party. 
I wish that there were more data points coming out here into um, 2011 and 2012 when the Republicans had captured Congress you know, and see what happens to him then. It's a period when he started to compromise a whole lot on issues. But um, at least in the beginning of his administration, people are characterizing him pretty much as a liberal. Um, but let me critique this for a minute. What's the big deal about being thought of as a liberal? Isn't the really big deal to be thought of as close to public opinion? You know, if the public is liberal and you're liberal, you're doing a pretty good job of representing the public mood. OK? So um, let's look at this a slightly different way. And what this does is, is compares a couple of different measures, um, a public opinion measure um, and, and a presidential stance measure on um, policy issues and the statistics are rather complicated but if you're down here on the bottom by zero that means that you're located right where the average voter is okay that means that you're as as close in pro you know in policy proximity to the average voter that's if there's a, such a thing as representative democracy this is what we strive towards this black line gives us an indication of where the average president stands compared to the public throughout US history. If you know a teeny bit of statistics, um, these um, numbers that I have here are just standard deviation units. Presidents are on average about 1.3 standard deviation units away from the average voter. That's a significant amount. That, that's a lot uh, of difference. Um, and you get some presidents who are really outside of this. Um, Harry Truman is the first data point here. I may not want to make a whole lot of um, point about this, but he was basically viewed as much more liberal than the public at that period of time. Um, same thing with Jimmy Carter. I mean, Jimmy Carter is a moderate to liberal Democrat when the public is probably in its most conservative um, mood during that period of time, so you get that very, very big gap. But um, look at the last two points here for Barack Obama. In 2009, Barack Obama is basically at the zero point here. He's doing really a remarkably good job of taking policy positions that are in sync with the public's mood. But you get into 2010 and you get some growing distance. Um, you get some growing distance, not necessarily because Obama has gotten more liberal, but because the public has gotten more conservative relative to Obama. And that explains a good deal of why the midterm elections came out the way they did. Um, the TARP, the deficit, and health care reform, um, are basically um, three policies that seem to have affected the public psyche this way. Um, one last point to make here, and uh, I drive my students crazy with charts like this, okay? <laughs> but um, it, they're better than listening to me. Um, one way of asking whether Obama is a liberal or or moderate is to ask the liberals whether they think he's a liberal <laughs> or a moderate. Um, and the punchline here is that there's been growing disenchantment among liberals with Barack Obama. Uh, not to the point that they're not going to vote for him, but um, here, let me just show this. Um, this is basically asking just liberals, self-identified liberals, whether they think that Obama is too liberal too conservative are about right. Um, if you look at you know, the top line, which is the about right, it's deteriorated among liberals from close to 90% support uh, that way down to about 60%. That's a fairly large erosion, you know, in um, how much liberals are enchanted with him. Um, as opposed to disenchanted. And if you look on the bottom, those that say that he's too conservative, there's been growing percentages saying that he's too conservative. Very few people think that he's too liberal. Okay, um, so what do we make of all this? I'm gonna try to sum all this up. Um, Obama's got a really difficult problem to solve. 
Um, the basic problem is polarization in the political system. Um, polarization in the political system makes it very, very difficult for him to attract people from the opposition party. Um, in the 1950s and 1960s, it was not hard for presidents to gain support of the opposition in Congress or among the mass public, in part because the parties were really amalgams of lots of different kinds of political orientation. So you could have conservative Democrats and liberal Democrats and conservative Republicans and liberal Republicans. It gave the president a, a lot of maneuverability um, in building coalitions. Uh, modern presidents in this polarized era don't have that kind of an environment anymore. Um, the liberals and conservatives have sorted into one party or the other, and they don't give any quarter to the other side. Um, I've been doing a little bit of research with a couple of colleagues, and one of the very striking things we find in looking at vote, it, behavior in Congress, it used to be that in the Senate, filibusters would only be used very, very rarely when somebody was really pissed about something. Now, whenever the minority party thinks it's going to lose, it calls or threatens a filibuster. It's just routine. Um, the Senate is no longer a majoritarian institution that occasionally <coughs> employs a filibuster to protect minorities. Now, it's a supermajority institution that is pretty much strangled by minorities that think that they're going to lose. Um, one of the other um, issues of a polarized political system, and this is kind of ironic, but um, when the parties are very polarized throughout history, they also tend to be of relatively equal strength. Uh, and that's been... Um, the case for the last 25 years or so. It was the case for the um, post-Reconstruction era as well. Um, when you don't have, when one party is really dominant over the other, the minority party tries to parrot the majority party. So you have Eisenhower Republicans were sure kind of lukewarm New Dealers. Don't have any you know, of that anymore. Um, now we have just real, real separation. When the parties are, are very far apart and evenly matched, the president just doesn't have much maneuvering room. Um, but at the same time that the parties are very, very competitive, neither one of them has enough of a hold over the public to guarantee their continued electability which means that a president like Obama has to be extreme to try to maintain party support, but has to look moderate in order to try to get the middle. And that's just a very, very difficult balancing act um, for him to do. Okay, so I know I talked much longer than I should have, and then Joe told me to, but, um, my 50-minute lectures last three weeks. <laughs> OK. Thank you very much, Professor Cohen. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. No? Yes. Now it is. Now it is. Yes. Thank you very, very much. Um, you've given us a lot of data and stuff to think about the <laughs> angles here. Um, I'd like to lead off with a question and then pass the microphone to other people. Uh, but my question is, um, would President Romney have the same problem? Um, if he talks about being post-partisan too and about how bipartisan he was with the Democratic legislature in Massachusetts, but of course he's not going to have an 87% Democratic legislature in Washington. Uh, he, if he wins, it's a fairly good chance that he would have a united Republican legislature. And so I guess the question is, is the uh, peculiar um, bind that Barack Obama is in, um, peculiar to Democratic presidents. Okay, you want me to try this one? Okay. Um, now, I don't think it's peculiar to Democratic presidents, 
because I think that George W. Bush suffered the same problem the last six years of his administration or so. Um, he just had a very, very difficult time with the Democrats. Um, if Bush had an advantage, at least in the um, earlier years of his administration, it was the war on terror, which at least in the public uh, kind of overwrote a lot of political divisions. You know, so um, you see, you know, after 9-11, Bush was about a 90% approval rating among almost all groups, and it just erodes. It takes a long time for that kind of an approval rating that's based on a structural change of the world you know, to vanish. And so it took around, you know, three years or so for it to vanish. And by the time it vanished, Bush had like a 90% approval rating among Republicans and a 10% approval rating among Democrats. Um, now he was lucky enough that you know, the lingering effects of 9-11 carried him through to a re-election, but it just got him re-elected and not much else. And so nothing else happened the rest of his administration. So um, I think that, um, and, but uh, George W. Bush, unlike Barack Obama, never claimed to be a post-partisan. He did claim to be a compassionate conservative, which is maybe the Republican way of saying a post-partisan. Um, but I, I think it's a structural problem. Um, I think Mitt Romney, if you've watched him last night and if you've watched his behavior since the Republican convention, he's starting to waffle on issues. He's starting to to obscure the hard line and try to make himself appealing to moderates. Okay? So given that you have all this information about um, the Obama administration reflecting Bush policies in the yeah. initial year, what is your sense of why the Republicans went so postal on it? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's knee-jerk partisanship to that extent. I'm not, I just don't know how much of this, for either party, is really out of um, oh, ideology or principle, uh, but partisan advantage. Um, the, the, uh, you know, a, another take on this is that by the end of the Bush years, George W. Bush is very, very unpopular in a lot of Republican quarters. I mean, the Tea Party, I think, is as much a reaction to Obama's big government policies as it was a reaction to failed Bush policies, like the Iraq War, um, the Afghanistan War, big government under Bush, um, you know, from big military spending, you know, to um, the um, health care spending under Bush. <laughs> so, um, so, so that's part of it. But um, so it, it's two parts. It's just intense partisanship. And, um, you know, a president who, of two presidents who looked like they were supporting corporate interest. I can't help following that up just a bit as I bring this over to Ken. Um, would you say, so you think that the Democrats are just as angry as the Republicans, or were just as angry about Bush with similar rhetoric to the Republican uh, anger at Obama? I'm trying to think of sort of what the Democratic equivalent of birtherism is. I actually do think, I mean, the Democratic rhetoric may not be as, um, I don't know what word to use. Um, but yeah, I think they're just about as angry. Um, and then, yeah, I do. Do you see a way out of the, uh, of the intense partisanship that this country is yeah. mired in? Is, is, there, is there a future for us? Yeah, oh yeah, there's always a future. Um, I think that, um, there are two solutions to the problem, one that won't happen and one that will happen 
if we live long enough. Um, the one that won't happen is a change of the way that we nominate candidates within the parties. The primary system and campaign money that comes from interest groups ha has really just pushed things to the different polls. And when you overlay on top of that redistricting so that you're protecting one party versus the other, you know, in you know, the, an incumbent security act. But I really think it's, um, it's the spread of primaries as the major way of nominating people. Um, even though that, that historically goes back longer with Democrats, but um, I mean, not Democrats, um, at the congressional level than it does with the presidential level, but there's this whole change in the campaign finance system that allowed the creation of PACs. You know, in the good old days, when unions and corporations could just bribe people and nobody would know, we didn't worry about this because they were playing both sides of the field. But with campaign finance regulations and trying to make everything transparent, it's different. And you get lots of non-corporate money in campaigns, you know, or non-union money in campaigns. Now you're getting a lot of single in interest group, and, and they go to one party or the other. Um, that's just not going to change. Um, no way that that's going to change. Um, I mean, not unless we become France is that going to change. Um, and Barack Obama told us that we shouldn't become France. Uh, the other thing is going to be demographics. Um, the growing populations of minority groups in the United States who tend heavily towards Democrats, um, I think is going to tip the balance very, very decidedly in a Democratic direction one day. Um, my reading of why the Democrats were so successful in realigning in the 30s was that there was a major influx of new voters into the political system. They were mostly immigrants and the children of immigrants, when the children of immigrants got to be of voting age, they brought their parents in to vote. You had a huge number of people voting, and they all flocked to the Democrats, the wet party. And the Democrats became the dominant party on demographics for a very long time, you know, for um, 25 years or so, you know, until they all moved out to the suburbs. Um, so I think that. Depending how fast immigrants politically integrate and vote, that may be um, the deciding point. But, um, but those are, tend to be slow processes. But when they happen, they happen all of a sudden. And George W. Bush knew that this was the fate of the Republican Party. As long as it's a white suburban party, it, they don't make enough babies. I, I tell my students um, the, uh, that babies become voters. And you know, Republican strategists need to understand that they may do well now, but they may not do well in 10 or 15 or 20 years. So. Uh, as far as explanations for polarization uh, go, you just give a bunch. And uh, I have to disagree with actually all of them. That's fine. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, first of all, redistricting. Uh, this is one of the really common misconceptions about how district lines are drawn, the idea that we are systematically getting rid of competitive districts. Uh, this hasn't happened at all. If you look at the proportion of, of congressional districts that are competitive over time, uh, it's varied essentially randomly. And if you look at the trends in redistricting and district composition and match that up with the trends in polarization in Congress, they do not match up at all. Okay. Uh, redistricting is simply not the cause of polarization. Um, uh, primaries. Uh, we've had primaries at the congressional level for a pretty long time. This was a progressive era reform, yeah. uh, and we had a long period of depolarization when primaries uh, were in effect. Uh, and one of the interesting things that we've seen recently is, is a fear among a lot of incumbents, particularly Republicans, that they will lose to a primary challenger if they are insufficiently uh, conservative. Mm. Uh, this is part of the mentality of the Republican Party right now, but it's a relatively recent phenomenon. And the trend towards polarization began long before oh, yeah. uh, this emerged. We started to see the Republican Party, uh, particularly in Congress, 
uh, start to get more ideologically uh, conservative, starting really in the 1970s, during which they were not afraid of primaries, where the general election was really uh, the bigger fear. So if we look at trends in primaries, that really doesn't work. Uh, uh, I see it, uh, you and I will disagree about that. That, that, that be, may, because that may, yeah, that may be yeah. uh, money. Well, I, people have spent a long time looking for the effects of campaign contributions, and most of the research uh, suggests that the effects are pretty minimal, if at all. Uh, so I, it, none of these explanations, uh, I, I think, really work. I think this is still a, a big puzzle. Why has the system become more polarized? I, I don't think we have a good answer for this. Well, I mean, uh, um, but I, I'm pretty sure that, that uh, it's not redistricting, it's not money, it's, and it's not primary. Well, those so. may be more symptoms. Um, Nolan McCarty basically argues that, it, that polarization is a function of economic inequality, and economic inequality is basically a function of open immigration. It's a, it's a relatively powerful argument. Um, I mean, and you're right, it, it's a complex phenomenon, but um, I do think that money is really very important in here. It's the ideological money you know, that, that's been pushing the system further apart. Um, I was wondering if you thought that candidates holding to their campaign process, or sorry, their campaign promises, was in the long term um, an effective agent of change, or if you thought that candidates once they're elected and maybe um, realizing the realities of getting what they want done, um, how hard that is, do you think compromise is more effective in that case? to create like long-term change instead of just having something proposed and then the next candidate opposing it and repealing it. Yeah, um, I mean, that, that's really rather good. I haven't thought about it in particular, but um, my gut instincts and my superficial answer would be that if you go back to a period where things were not so polarized, presidential candidates, even congressional candidates would offer up certain promises, they'd be vague, and they compromise enough to win a bill through Congress, but wouldn't give away the whole store in doing it. So Lyndon Johnson, you know, um, at several times compromised quite a bit on civil rights legislation. But the other side of it is that um, when great big policies like that are passed, there's overwhelming party you know, majorities in there. I mean, Johnson had just massive parties to support him. Um, in a, one of the ironies about polarization is that neither party seems to be able to capture a decisive majority, which means that a lot of the politics is, I think it's, it's basically the politics of legislative um, subversion that one party it thinks that it's going to lose is just going to destroy any opportunity for the other party to win and will refuse to compromise. Would that, um, that change take place, sort of make it a stagnant policy environment? Unless things got so bad that members of both parties decide that they have to do something. That's why the, the, um, the TARP program, which is the bailout for the banks, got passed when it got um, rejected the first day in the House, I think it was, there was a 500 or 800 point drop on Wall Street in one day. And that scared everybody. Um, so that, you know, they, um, they amended the bill uh, basically to make it a little bit more transparent, you know, to have some congressional oversight of it, um, and then they passed it. You know, and did it very quickly. But it's, um, the world has to go to hell before they're willing to <laughs> give anything up, really. No. I'm about, I'm about to hand this to Mark, but uh, as, as I'm walking it over to Mark, there's another theory of the, uh, of the reasons for polarization, which is that uh, there are now alternative realities, that, uh, yeah. that there's a, a Republican think tank and media and so on world, and a Democrat, or maybe wimpy Democrat, think tank and media world. And so if you listen to the politicians give speeches, if you listen to, if you read the Republican platform, it is a different world than the Democratic platform's world. 
and that so that the, the process of political communication arguably are very different from what they were in the past. Uh, <laughs> no, no, we're, we're, we're recording. Oh, okay. Um, so I have three comments or, or questions. Um, so going back to your data regarding uh, broken promises and success rate, yeah. um, even though the majority of campaign promises, or they did not meet the majority of their campaign promises, I believe it was 40 percent. So yeah. it is a plurality of promises. So I, I guess one way to view it is um, at least that is the most compared to uh, the other categories you yeah. have there. Um, yeah. In terms of uh, um, they did uh, they did promise some things, and 40% of the time they uh, followed through on that. Um, my my question re related to that is, um, how does he uh, compare to recent presidents? And number two, um, James Thruber has done something like this uh, in, a, in an edited volume that I think was his. And he said, if I recall correctly, that Obama has had a, a success rate close to LBJ. No, he has a roll call win rate close to LBJ. The issue is that it's very hard to get things from the president's agenda onto the congressional agenda. Once it gets onto the congressional agenda, he can win, but that's only the first two years. Um, his win rate after the Republicans take over Congress goes down a whole lot. Um, and it primarily goes down that they don't vote on anything from Obama. Um, remember the old days of, um, of um, Reagan budgets, dead on arrival. Obamas are dead before born. They don't get anywhere. They don't get out of committee. Sure. So, so it, it, you, we have to be careful when we're making these comparisons because the, um, there's lots of different dimensions you know, um, of going on here. Mm -hmm. I do not know if this has been a, uh, an autopsy uh, on the Obama administration or if this has been a medical analysis with uh, an eye towards a cure. Um, I suppose we won't, that's not a decision for either, for any of us here to make. Uh, we'll have a better idea in, on November 6th. Uh, thank you very, very much, thank you. Professor Cohen, and thank you very much. Thank you.